All right. Welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. Uh, this morning, we're welcoming Ben Hubbard, the CEO of Nexus PMG. Welcome, Ben. Hey, Raj. How's it going? I'm doing well. How are you doing this morning? Fantastic. Thanks for having me. Well, Ben, I think um, we, we want to start, start off with is um, the origin story of Nexus PMG, how we got to where we are today. So if you don't mind leading up with that, really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I'm excited to tell the story, actually. It's a very interesting one with lots of ups and downs and side to sides. But uh, so myself and uh, two colleagues, Roshan Vani and Paul Hammond, were the co-founders of Nexus PMG. Um, in 2013, we were working for a really large engineering construction company. Um, we were sitting in a office in Saudi Arabia where we all were working together on a very large mega project. And uh, as that project was coming to an end, we realized we had a unique set of skill sets that would allow us to uh, to kind of come together and offer something unique in the market, specifically around risk analysis. So mm -hmm. um, we had kind of a unique capability to take, um, to assess the risk of a project and then really transform that risk into conclusions and kind of informative actions for, uh, for the clients that we were working for at the time. Um, and it was really heavily technology driven. So we thought that was a little bit of our differentiator as mm. to, you know, kind of leverage technology. We were all in our mid to late twenties. So it kind of made sense to try to figure out how to, uh, you know, use that angle because let's be honest, not very many people were going to respect a consultant that walks in the door and says, you know, you're in your late twenties. What could you possibly know? So, right, right. so we, we went, uh, we formed Nexus in 2013, moved from Saudi Arabia back to Dallas with the, uh, with the big picture view of, you know, taking over the world from a, <laughs> from a risk assessment perspective. Um, turns out that's a little bit harder than, <laughs> than one might think. Well, the weather's the same, right? So yeah, the weather's the same. Right. It's still hot. Um, but it was fun. We So what we did was we put together our marketing material, we put together our brand, and we hit the road. And I mean, literally hit the road in a uh, Roshan's used uh, hand-me-down minivan from his <laughs> uncle, jumped in the minivan and drove around the United States trying to sell services. And I'll never forget our very first pitch when we walked into a, to a prospective client <laughs> And the, we gave our pitch, and the first response was, why would I hire you when I have work boots that were older than you and have more experience? And he pointed <laughs> to the corner of these rusty, <laughs> crusted up work boots, and that's a pretty tough thing to respond to. Right. But, uh, uh, you know, pers you know, but so we, we uh, over the, you know, the course of about 18 months, we kind of, mm -hmm. you know, adapted and refined our strategy as we got really good feedback. And, you know, that's one of the lessons learned was, you know, count on having failure and feedback mm -hmm. and leveraging that to, to reshape your business and don't be afraid to, you know, to kind of pivot your business model a little bit as you, as you kind of learn where you really fit in the market. And so, uh, and so that's what we did. And we figured out that, um, we really had an opportunity to leverage that technology for the investment community more than the guys that were building these projects, EPC contractors and things. So did you find that, um, this particular area of, I'm going to say infrastructure projects, was behind the curve on technology? A little bit. And I think there was kind of this um, this world of, you know, I've done it for 30 years. I can just benchmark this experience against 10 other projects. But mm -hmm. what was really lacking was the understanding that every project is truly unique. Mm -hmm. You could have two projects that are built side by side that have the exact same design and have very different outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just the nature of the game. And it comes to, uh, you know, the, the big infrastructure world when it comes from engineering construction. And so... You know, we realize that we have to educate, you mm -hmm. know, some of this client base that that is indeed a reality. You can't just look at a financial model and say, well, these 10 other projects did X, Y, Z. So therefore, this that's how this one's going to go. And mm -hmm. so technology allowed us to show that uniqueness. So was the technology a particular methodology, software, project management tool? What kind of technology was it? It's a little bit of a hybrid. So it was a little bit of technology relative to, you know, software like Monte Carlo simulation modeling, okay. um, you know, taking out some of the ambiguity of the risk assessment, but also the ability to look at things through a little bit of a different lens in a different way in terms of how risk is perceived mm -hmm. within a within a project. And when you're an investor into a project, it's all about risk. It's a hundred percent risk assessment. It's I'm putting money into this project. Mm -hmm. What is the risk I don't get paid back or the risk right. that my returns that I'm expecting in my performance are not achieved? So um, in the interest of those that might not know what the Monte Carlo 
is. Can you give a brief 30 second as to the, what that viewpoint might be? Yeah, so it's essentially a, a way to simulate uh, thousands of iterations of potential outcomes mm -hmm. based on the inputs that you put in. So you can put a range of inputs in. Mm -hmm. um, and then Monte Carlo is an old school technique that's been adapted to modern times that will essentially simulate over thousands and thousands of different variations of different outcomes and give you a distribution of what different likelihoods of events are going to occur at different probabilities. So mm -hmm. you could get down to the point where you could say at 90, there's a 95% chance X is going to happen. There's a 50% chance that Y is going to happen. And you can actually look at it from a statistical perspective and understand, um, you know, really where the likelihood that um, you will fall into a certain category or a certain budget or a certain schedule outcome based got, on that. Got you. So it sounds like to me, you know, a lot of times the innovation you see or hear of people taking a technology or something that works almost in one industry and bring it to another industry. It sounds like you were doing some of that too. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. And, mm -hmm. you know, the idea was is to bring a fresh look mm -hmm. to the project finance world and, um, you know, kind of give them – you know, a unique perspective uh, rather than kind of the traditional just, you know, benchmark, write a report and walk away. And I think that's where our uniqueness kind of allowed us to slowly but surely uh, scratch and claw and earn the respect of some of these big funds and these new clients. Um, it took some time. You said you're 18 months in, right? Yeah, so it was then... probably, you know, we had a few contracts. We had, mm -hmm. we worked for Samsung early on and went oh, to Korea okay. for several months to advise them on some project management related elements. And um, we had a couple small contracts with some kind of friends and family stuff clients of mm -hmm. ours. Um, but our first real big opportunity was to advise a fund called GSO Capital, which is a okay. subsidiary fund of Blackstone um, on a wood pellet deal in Canada, um, and okay. really use that Monte Carlo modeling and use that risk assessment capability to kind of tell them where the risk of putting their capital was likely going to sit and you know what the, what the probability that the amount of money they were investing was actually going to be enough mm -hmm. and that it would get the job done. And what was the outcome of that project? So that project, uh, it had its troubles. There was a, you know, it's a tough industry. It was mm -hmm. a wood pellet manufacturing and it's had kind of its known issues. But uh, generally speaking, our assessment was pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. um, we told them that there was a high probability that the project was going to end up in a delay scenario and that there was probably going to be a required more capital. And ultimately it did. Um um, and but at the end of the day, GSO Capital uh, exited that investment with a positive return, and mm -hmm. I think they uh, they were oh, let's put it this way: they were well informed as to the likelihood of their investment ending up the way it did. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think they appreciated that they were you know regardless of whether it went up, down, or sideways, they kind of had a view and had an understanding of what was likely to happen, so they could prepare accordingly. Got you. So GSO and Blackstone are pretty big names. Um, were you able to leverage those names going forward then and your additional clients? Absolutely. I think that if, you know, looking back years ago, I think that was one of the bigger catalysts, right? Because mm -hmm. once you have that big name, it kind of establishes a trust factor that might not have been there originally. Um, again, you know, you're 28 years old, walk into an, mm -hmm. into a hedge fund or a big infrastructure fund and it's hard to get taken seriously. But once you have a couple, you know, Samsung and you have a GSO capital and you have a couple people start to wonder, well, these other guys brought them in. They must have something. So let's at least hear them out. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of a big catalyst for us to uh, to kind of move in. And, and specifically in the wood pellet sector and in, in more specifically, you know, we became kind of a industry known name in the wood pellet space, which mm -hmm. was thriving and growing at the time. And there was other investors looking into those spaces. So, you know, not only was it valuable from trading off of a client name, but also valuable from trading off an experience in a very niche market um, that would allow us to to work with other big name clients because there wasn't a lot of people who understood wood pellets. So um, if I understand correctly, the wood pellets fall under the renewable and sustainable. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, there's obviously a lot of uh, information out there that will take, you know, both sides of, of the coin of view. Right. But generally speaking, it's, um, you know, it's heavily subsidized in Europe to, to burn mm -hmm. wood pellets rather than burn coal. Mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of evidence out there that speaks to, you know, the, the it's carbon neutral relative to when you take into consideration all the elements and logistics, com you know, elements of the projects. Um, so it kind of was our first foray into the uh, sustainable infrastructure world. Okay. So you were doing more traditional projects, let's call it perhaps oil and gas or metals and minings before? Yeah, mining and metals, um, you know, were a big, we did a lot of power, traditional power generation, coal and combined cycle, which we had a lot of experience in working for our previous company. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, if we were going to trade off of our individual experience rather than our company right. resume, it made sense to work in places that we could at least try to trade off of that. So that had been our prior experience up to then. So did this wood 
would you say the wood pellet project was your first foray into that sustainable, which started to lead you to adjacent projects in that space? A hundred percent. I mean, it was looking back, it's really the, um, and I, I can't sit here and say we were some sort of soothsayer and we knew that, you know, mm-hmm. that was going to end up pushing us into the direction we live today, but it ultimately was, I mean, it just kind of fell naturally into our lap. Um, wood pellets became, you know, other projects on the fringes of interesting biomass related projects in particular, where you were transforming, you know, some sort of biomass product into a new, a new product, whether that was energy or whether it was, you know, some sort of, um, you know, alternative fuel, whatever that may be. So Mm -hmm. it kind of naturally led us into projects that had similar elements. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that, that's kind of what, you know, established that foundation. So if I'm hearing you correctly, and it started to lead your expertise in that area, um, what led your interests towards the renewable and sustainable space? So I think it was a combination of um, just a natural progression of the business relative to what we found ourselves doing for these funds. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so we naturally kind of uh, you know, worked in wood pellets and we worked in, um, you know, some of the anaerobic digestion and things we'll talk about relative to industries. But so some of it was just a little bit chance, mm-hmm. which is, you know, kind right. of half the of battle course. is right. just following what you can, <laughs> when you're an early stage company, right, you right. claw and scratch at whatever o- you can get. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the rest of it was kind of um, understanding the market conditions around it, right? Educating ourselves that, hey, this is this is more than just, you know, a wood pellet plant or, mm-hmm. a, you know, a, an anaerobic digestion facility. This is a fast growing market. Mm-hmm. We're seeing more and more of these projects um, come to life. We're re- doing a lot more analysis of the various investment of the investment community looking to put work in this space, driven a lot by consumers uh, mm-hmm. wanting more sustainable options, driven by um, government subsidies, driven by, um, you know, conscious capital, all the things really. So we thought, well, heck, if this if this is really going this direction, then maybe it makes sense for us to um, to look into this more as kind of the niche that we focus on. And then you just kind of wrap that all around, you know, with the the the, the beauty of, hey, we're making an impact here. Mm-hmm. So we can do both. Right. We can build our business around being, you know, making an impact on the environment, making an impact um, on change, mm-hmm. while also making uh, money for our clients and advising them on that you can have this kind of triple bottom line movement. So – in the last, let's call it three years, um, have you seen interest from the investment community be about the same or have you seen it increase? Increase for sure. Um, I would say in 20, I mean, even as fast as the last five or six years in 2013, if I had to just kind of ballpark it, I would say, you know, two to three of the 10 projects we would see were kind of in this world. Now I would say it's north of five to six, maybe even seven. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the next 10 years, it's eight or more. Um, and a lot of that is driven by the fact that, um, we have a lot of challenges both globally and within the United States, um, that need to be solved. Mm -hmm. And, um, there are a lot of programs and there's a lot of common coming together to understand that, you know, we need to solve these problems, Mm -hmm. but there's also elements of, Hey, we've technology is advanced. Mm -hmm. Um, government subsidy programs exist where you can make, you know, you can get the financial returns your Mm -hmm. investors need while solving these problems. Mm -hmm. Um, so you had mentioned anaerobic digestion earlier. Could you give the audience just a brief insight into what that is? Yeah, anaerobic digestion is the process of taking some sort of organic matter. And in most cases, when people refer to it, it's like dairy waste. Okay. So think about like a dairy farm, right? You have 20,000 head of, of dairy mm-hmm. uh, cattle. And so they're producing obviously a, a massive amount of waste on a daily basis. And so you've got to do something with that. And mm-hmm. there's lots of different ways that, you know, traditionally that gets solved for, you can spread it on the land, um, for fertilizer, but that's only, you know, so doable for mm-hmm. smaller farms. You can landfill it. Um, you can have it taken away and, um, uh, used for, you know, some sort of co-product and fertilizer. So may I stop you for a minute? Yeah. They actually take manure and put it in a landfill. Some, some folks do. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's not as common as some of the other alternatives, but yeah, there are, there are farms out there and that are trying to solve from that. Um, it's, it's more rare, but it does happen. Um, and the reality is they just, you know, they have to figure out some way and it, you know, state by state, there's Mm -hmm. different regulations and different rules. Um, but what's happened in, you know, and anaerobic digestion has existed for quite a while and it's existed in Europe for an extremely long time. It's the process of essentially taking that organic matter um, and then introducing, you know, various different types of microorganisms mm-hmm. um, and biological matter um, that will essentially allow that waste stream to be reduced and produce biogas. 
Um, and so what will happen is you can take that biogas and you can then feed it into like a caterpillar engine to produce power. You can put it through a gas upgrading cycle mm -hmm. to produce clean, renewable, natural gas. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the modern day technology and the modern day uh, capabilities are driven by, you know, government programs like California, for example, has the low carbon fuel standard, where if okay. you produce renewable fuels from an organic matter like that, you get a big subsidy to support it. Um, the federal government has one as well called the renewable fuel standard. Same mm -hmm. thing. If you have a certain pathway with a certain organic matter producing something like renewable fuel or renewable driven energy, you can get a subsidy. So mm -hmm. the investment community loves it. Um, obviously, because, you know, the higher return profiles, the farms love it because they typically can get a little bit of a share of it. They can solve their waste problem, which is their biggest mm -hmm. issue. Um, and so kind of everybody, everybody wins, if you will. So these subsidies obviously affect the way the investment community looks at making the investments. Mm -hmm. If the subsidies were to go away, would the community still see a reasonable return on their investments? It's a little bit dependent upon which avenue you go down. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if you produce power and mm -hmm. you can get a nice power purchase agreement from a big utility that mm -hmm. that can justify the return profiles, then yes. Um, in the renewable natural gas space, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, and then it depends what type of waste stream. So like mm -hmm. dairy farms, um, you know, they'll typically give you the waste, you know, and you and you consume it and and you move forward from there. But like municipal solid waste, for example, um, typically comes with something called a tip fee. So what's an example of a municipal solid waste? Like uh, fats and solids and greases and, um, you know, trash that comes from, you know, when you get your trash and your recycling picked up, plastics, um, you know, biosolids, your mm -hmm. actual waste, you know, from wastewater plants. It's anything that's kind of, you know, literally everything you throw out in your trash gotcha. has to go somewhere, right? And right now it typically goes to a landfill. But if they you, get separated? Um, it's supposed to. In okay. many cases it does and in others it doesn't. Um, but, you know, those those different um, waste streams are valuable. Mm -hmm. And so what you'll see is folks taking those waste streams and where a landfill, let's say, might charge $40, $50, $60 dollars a ton to take that mm -hmm. from you and, and landfill it. Um you know, these anaerobic digestion or other technologies that exist will charge the same amount um, and they'll process it. So think about having like a power plant that's fired by gas where mm -hmm. you're getting paid to put the gas in the power plant, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the, right. the amount of investment return that comes from that. And the beauty of that is now you have a diversified revenue stream. Mm -hmm. So now a large portion of your revenue comes from those tip fees, a portion comes from a power purchase agreement, and a portion comes from the renewable natural gas sales. So now only a little bit of your revenue is exposed to a federal so subsidy. So you diversify. Now they make a lot of sense. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag, and it comes down to the waste stream itself that usually defines whether or not they can survive without a subsidy. Got you. So going back to these different technology pieces, are you seeing like a um, almost like a Moore's law happening here where you're seeing the technology improve at a much faster rate than it was before? It's starting to. Yeah, I would say um, it's improving in efficiency. Mm -hmm. But I think actually, believe it or not, the driving force is the ability to actually pre-treat and handle the waste before it goes into any of these systems. Okay. A lot of these systems have been functioning and been successful for quite a while. The problem is it's very hard to run them efficiently if you can't truly separate and understand your waste stream. So a lot of these state level uh, regulations, particularly in California now, they make you separate your organics, your plastics, and all the various different waste streams. Um, and if you can figure out how to solve that problem and you can actually balance the equation going into these facilities, it makes it a lot easier for them to be efficient and produce the yields that you're expecting. So I would say some of it is just um, you know, state and federal level requirements kind of getting stricter around how we actually get rid of our waste. Mm -hmm. um, and then some of it is the technology advancing, um, allowing for better conversion and higher yields. Um, and then some of it is just um, understanding, you know, the, the subsidies and the various different revenue streams and putting together projects that have kind of these diversified portfolios. Got you. So what are some of the more um, interesting projects that you're currently working on or have worked on recently? Oh, there's some really exciting ones. So um, one that I really enjoy keeping up with is a project that is um, called a molded fiber packaging facility. Okay. So what it does is it takes uh, miscanthus grass, which oh, is – What is that? Miscanthus grass is like a 15, 20-foot tall uh, weed okay. basically. Um and it's perennial, so it regrows naturally like mm -hmm. a weed would in your in your yard. Okay. Um, 
And we take that and it goes through a drying process and a thermoforming process, which is a type of technology and essentially makes – uh, you can make molded fiber-based package products. So the easiest way to think of that is if you've ever been to Chipotle, okay. Um, okay. the bowls that you are that you get, if mm-hmm. you get a you know a bowl burrito bowl, those bowls that have that kind of grainy texture mm-hmm. um, or even egg cartons. They're like cardboardy like, almost. Yeah, cardboard. like those egg cartons that have that yep. kind of grainy texture. That's usually made from a biomass product, okay. um, which is biodegradable and sustainable. And so we're making those products to replace single-use plastics, right? Because plastics are being banned. Single-use plastics are being banned all over the country. Mm-hmm. They've been banned in Canada. I think California just went there. California is there. Um, You know, there's just lots. It it won't be long, I imagine, before the entirety of the U.S. bans it. Um, And so these alternative products to replace them are required. Um, And so this particular company we're working with has found this technology to be very successful. Um, They've done one plant and we're we're working with them to build and scale up their business so they can build multiple of these facilities and sell these products to the Chipotles of the world to really replace their reliance on plastic. So that's an interesting project. How did you find out about that project? So we, uh, through one of our investors that we work with closely, so you know, the genesis of our business being Nexus PMG is an advisory services business where, mm-hmm. you know, in today's environment versus, you know, the old days of driving around a minivan, mm-hmm. we are, uh, you know, we're, we work with 30 plus uh, of the world's largest infrastructure funds and private equity firms. And a lot of those funds, right, they, they want to put money out the door. That's what they mm-hmm. exist to do. Um, and so they will bring us into a lot of these projects to help speed up the timeline and make sure that these projects get to a point where they can underwrite them. And so for this particular one, the, this, uh, an investor brought us in one of our clients to, to work alongside the uh, the company that's producing these products um, to really just kind of add an extra layer of of strength behind you know moving the project forward, helping them design the facility, um, helping them identify the site location where it should be built, um, you know validating the technology. Um, you know, going through the process of permitting the facility, all the things you would, you know, there's a lot that comes to building a large, you know, 50, 60 or $100 million infrastructure right. project. Um, and so we, we, we gained access to them through that network and then uh, been really excited about working with them. And are you seeing more of your investor community bring these kind of projects to you? Yeah. So that's the interesting thing. What we, about three years into advising these funds, what we realized was that there was this common theme that occurred whereby they would put term sheets out and say, hey, we really want to f- give you $100 million to build the next two facilities or your first one. Mm-hmm. Um, but what would happen is years would go by and these facilities just couldn't get to a point or these developers couldn't get their projects to a point where the funds could underwrite them. There's a mm-hmm. lot of check boxes. Um, and if you don't check every one, they won't give you the money. And mm-hmm. it's not because they don't want to. It's because they have to satisfy Protection, these, pr- right. these conditions right. precedent to to protect their investors um, and make sure that these projects will hit the return profiles that they're they're expected to hit. Um, and so because we kept seeing that over and over again, what we did is we essentially launched the business line called Nexus PDS, stands okay. for Project Development Services. And now we specialize in all those things I just mentioned. We have a full in-house engineering design team that will design these facilities to a point where a big engineering construction company can take it and actually move forward with it gotcha. uh, with a really strong package. We'll help them select the right type of site to make sure um, you know it's built with the right type of infrastructure around it, power, water, gas, all the things that are required to run these facilities. Um, We'll help them with permitting so we can speed up the timeline. And most importantly, we help them make sure that the contracts that they're signing for their sales agreement for the long term, Mm -hmm. for their feed stock, for any of the supply, you know, whether it's Miscantis or it's, um, you know, orange citrus peels or whatever it is, make sure that everything's back to back and that those agreements are strong enough where a fund can underwrite them so that the risk uh, protections exist in them to get the funds, funds comfortable enough to say, okay, even though there's risk, mm-hmm. we've protected the downside by doing X, Y, and Z. And we have a very strong grasp of that from advising these gotcha. funds so we can relay that on to the developer and work with them. So you mentioned citrus peels. Tell me more. Yeah. So um, a couple of years ago, we started working with a developer. Now, maybe about a year and a half um, that is doing a really interesting project in Florida where they take um, – citrus peel after it's been juiced by a juice manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's very valuable nutrients inside of a a citrus peel, one being something called pectin. Um, If you're a a fan of uh, your morning peanut butter jelly sandwich or (laughs) any any type of jelly on your toast, uh, you'll look at the back of a a jelly, for example, and you'll often see pectin as an ingredient. And it's basically a, a natural binding 
agent. Mm. It's like a powder okay. um, that you will see in jams and jellies and even increasingly in the pharmaceutical industry in gel capsules. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, the consumer markets today are looking for more natural products, right? They don't want to see all these different products that end in os and mally this right. and right. So pectin is one of those. Um, and so what we've done is we're designing and we're pretty close to closing financing on a facility that will take these wet, this wet citrus peel, mm-hmm. um, basically process the peel such that it produces the pectin and mm-hmm. sells it through a long-term agreement to a very creditworthy off taker. Okay. Um, and then we create all sorts of byproducts from there, like some stuff called flavonoids. We can make citrus molasses that goes to the rum industry for natural flavoring. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we can take the peel. Now that the peel has been completely stripped of its nutrients and it's nothing but just a dry n- non-nutrient based peel. Mm-hmm. And you can take that and you can sell it for fibers. You can mm-hmm. densify it and sell it as cattle feed. Okay. Uh, so there's all sorts so it's the kind of the concept of this the circular economy methodology, right, right. but within a project, right? Take it and use everything you possibly can and extract all the value you possibly can. So we're really excited about that project and we're hoping to close the financing on that and break ground in the coming months. Very interesting. So you mentioned an energy project in the world of anaerobic digestion. You spoke about a MXG project for fiberboard and a pectin project. Um, you kind of touched on your project management services and it sounds like you work with the developers too. Are you still working with your technology piece? Yep. That's our uh, third and uh, still primary business line called Nexus OS. Um, okay. It's our technology as a service arm. So in between all this madness, <laughs> we've just, we have years ago, we launched and built our own software. Now, we did it in-house. Um, it's a project management software. Outward facing, it's known as cloud EPC. Um, and essentially, it is a project management software built for infrastructure projects, process-based facilities. Okay. Um, we couldn't find what we what we needed on the market at the time. So we built a very kind of lightweight access database to do these things mm-hmm. and really for internal use to manage our own projects. Um, and then what we realized after a couple of years was that our clients were actually really loving the outputs and actually asking us if they could use it. But okay. it wasn't really – it was an access database. So it wasn't really built for a collaborative or – web-based environment. Mm-hmm. So we brought in a CTO and we actually commercialized the product um, a couple years back. And happy to say that that product is now used by a lot of big clients like Parsons and Deloitte, Skanska, um, and it's used to, uh, to manage these projects uh, all over the world. Um, and then as we kind of f- you know, continue to round out our technology offering, we started layering things like drone monitoring services, right? Mm-hmm. These funds want to see these facilities come to life, but they have so many investments, they can't put their boots on the ground all the time. So we'll monitor them with drone videos and we'll narrate those drone videos and share that with the investment community so they can kind of see the time phased, you know, construction occurring in front of them. Um, we also do things like 3D laser scanning. So okay. we'll actually use what's called point cloud technology to actually, um, you know, 3D model an old building that probably doesn't have any drawings and certainly doesn't have a 3D model. Um, so that way, when you're using that to, to, to build out the rest of your facility, you kind of already have a design basis and so you're not kind of guessing. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, technology is still at the heart of the, uh, the founding you know, company, uh, founding team. Um, and we have a lot of technology enthusiasts, so it still remains a very viable part of our business. It kind of wraps around the other two business lines to just increase the value proposition. And and like you said, it sounds like additional revenue too. Yeah. We generate revenue off of license fees, Mm -hmm. um, and various different types of consulting services that sit on top of that. Um, and you know, it's a nice little business for us and it's growing. Um, we have a lot of interest in this, in these various different technologies in particular software. Um, and so, you know, we, we're very different than most software companies where we're not really, we don't full-time salespeople out there mm-hmm. hitting the road. It's more opportunistic for us. We try to find clients that really can value or derive value from the software. We want the right fit. We don't want to try to force it mm-hmm. um, onto companies just because, you know, we want to gain some revenue. It's, right. you know, it's not the traditional model, but um, it's it's our model. So you're six and a half, seven years in now. Yep. Um, how many offices do you have? Uh, we have three dedicated offices and a large presence in Canada, considering an office up there. Are they uh, minivans or proper offices? Proper offices, okay. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not not mobile offices. Okay. Uh, so our headquarters is in Dallas, mm-hmm. um, where, you know, just north of downtown, where, um, you know, we have a large portion of our folks sit, especially our executive team. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a beautiful office in downtown Greenville, South Carolina. Interesting. Um, Why Greenville? 
So Greenville is a big hub for engineering and construction companies, believe it or not. So a lot of the big predominant firms have big regional or even headquarters there. Um, so the ability to attract talent for our engineering team and mm -hmm. our development team out there is perfectly suited. Our office is beautiful. It's it's right on Main Street downtown, which is a little bit unique. Uh, most of the companies, the big companies are on the fringes of the city, okay. uh, which it's a thriving city. Um, it's a beautiful downtown award winning. So a lot of the younger generation engineers love, like to be down there. Interesting. Um, and then we also have a really cool, we like basically renovated an old 1920s car dealership. Um, and so it's kind of wow. got this old vibe to it, but modernized. So like even the wood floors still have the old oil slicks wow. and, uh, you know, like you can still look up in the roof of the rafters and see the pulley system where they used to take the cars from the ground floor and put them in the show showroom up above. And so it's really cool. And a lot of our young engineers and a lot of our clients really enjoy the story behind it. So you mentioned an engineering team in Greenville and some of the other companies that are out, out there. Are you attracting some of the talent from those companies? Absolutely. It's um, the buzz in that city in particular has been really exciting to see. Um, we've made some really key hires over the better part of the last 18 months. Um, you know, and what we've learned, and I think most companies see this, is when you bring in top talent, a lot of people want to follow that because they mm -hmm. get interested. They say, well, you know, why would this guy go work for this company? Never heard of them. You know, mm -hmm. he, had, he could write his check at any company. And so we've been able to attract some really amazing talent um, from those companies. And then, you know, that talent has basically been able to identify additional talent mm -hmm. that want to follow them. And, and I think it's a combination of our culture. You know, we're a, we're a bit younger. Our average age of our company is probably mid thirties, late thirties. Okay. Um, we do things a little bit differently from that perspective, right? We're a very, very employee first focused company. Okay. Um, we have a lot of fun. We let people work from home when they need to, right? You know, if they need to take care of their family, take days off. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the you know, if you get your job done, we're we're not going to sit over the top of you. Um, breathe down your neck sort of mentality. Right. It's And, uh, you know, we share in the upside of the business with our employees. Um, you know, we do a lot of company events. We have, you know, a lot of fun stuff in the office to keep everybody motivated. Okay. So that's a big part of it. And then another big part of it is what we're seeing is just the motivation to work in the sustainable environment. We have a lot of folks that really want to, you know, have a legacy for their children, for example. And I've been told this many times, which is I want to wake up 25 years from now and say, I made an impact. Um, and so there's, you know, I want to be able to tell my children, look them in the eye and say, you know, I, re I did everything I possibly can to, to, you know, better the world for, mm -hmm. for lack of a better way to say it. And so um, it's pretty exciting to see, um, you know, some of the different motivations that drive, drive these generations. So it sounds very much like a, you know, a modern day engineering firm mm -hmm. that is gearing itself up to attract the kind of talent that's looking to do something different in their world. Yeah. Um, I also feel like, you know, the messaging that you're giving regarding some of the projects and the areas that you're working in. So, you know, the podcast is called Bigger Than Us. Mm -hmm. So if you can kind of, in a nutshell, tell us why Nexus is working on these kind of projects and what you see Nexus developing into, let's call it next three to five years. Appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we are, we're launching a new website next week. Okay. Um, and it really tells the story of the bigger than us theme, right? It's, uh, you know, the, basically it comes down to, we want to build a better world. We have realized over the past five or six years that we can do that while also building a sustainable business and making sure our investors hit their return profiles. There's no reason why they have to be independent of one another. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we are really going all in. We are going to, by 2020, we are not going to be working at all on any, oil and gas projects or any non-low carbon initiative based projects. Mm -hmm. um, we're pretty much there now, probably mm -hmm. 95%. Okay. Um, but, you know, we have some legacy clients and legacy work that we just want to see out, right, uh, you course. know, which is the right thing to do. Um, but we're going all in on that. So that's a big part of our transition is to make sure the what we really want to be known in the industry as the go-to best firm in the business for going to these kind of waste to value alternative technology based projects, which like I said before, we think are going to be predominantly a large part of these investors' uh, portfolios going forward. Um, and so if an investor is building a project three years from now mm -hmm. and it has something to do with transforming waste or biomass or anaerobic digestion or you know some sort of transformative product, um, we want them to go, well, you have to go to Nexus because those guys are the industry-leading firm without question. Um, and so as we continue to build our brand, um, you know, that's a big part of our strategy is getting our name out there to make sure that companies see us mm -hmm. that way. Um, 
So that's a big part of our, our growth strategy. And then another big part of our growth strategy is to ultimately um, start to put some skin in the game. So we want okay. to actually start, um, you know, owning some of these facilities by mm -hmm. putting, you know, our own reinvesting some of the profits of the business back into the industry. Um, there's one particular set of capital that's very difficult for developers to acquire, which is called development capital. Okay. There's a lot of money out there for, um, you know, the believe it or not, it's actually easier to get the 50 or $100 million than it is to get the first two or three. You need to get to a point where you can get that $50 million. Okay. And if you kind of relate it to the tech world, Raj, it's right. basically similar. It's like that angel round is always hard Safe to find. Funding. It's family money. Right. It's friend money. It's hard to get. But once you get to a point where your company has kind of got some revenue which established, that that series round, A round is a lot easier to get right. because now you've got a brand. Mm -hmm. And so we have a vision because of our skill sets to be that angel round, if you will, for okay. infrastructure, which is, you know, typically somewhere between one and $3 million to do things like put the site under control. Like you need an option contract or buy the land to pay the lawyers, to pay a firm, to do all the engineering that is required to get to mm -hmm. a point where you can get a firm bid on the contract value. Um, to pay for the permit fees for the EPA, all the things that cost money to get to a project to a point where it could be underwritten. So our vision essentially is to eventually launch kind of a family office okay. derived from Nexus's cash flows that feeds money back into the community for these specific types of projects. Um, and then get to a point where, you know, by making those investments, we have upside in the projects. Mm -hmm. And then Nexus PMG and PDS and our subsidiary companies essentially act as the services partner to make sure that they're successful and protect our investment. So it's kind of a vertical integration type methodology. So you mentioned the family office there, and I'm sure there's an education piece there too. There's an education piece where some of these family offices might be familiar with renewable and sustainable, but aren't familiar with the more interesting projects that you're doing. Yeah. So how do you plan to launch some of that? Yeah. So we've recently hired a couple new folks that are specializing essentially in educating and reaching out to these family offices and these high net worth individuals um, to kind of make them realize that this is an opportunity. Um, to invest in these projects. I mean, if you're a if you're a family office, it's not every day you wake up and somebody says, "Hey, do you want to take oranges and turn it into pectin?" And, right. You know. So some of this is just making the community investment in community in this that you know high net worth private uh, small private equity family office world aware that this exists mm -hmm. and that they can diversify their portfolio. They don't have to just be real estate or they don't just have to be, you know, something you know ener traditional energy. And um, they can carve out a portfolio and then. Also, obviously, layering in the nexus value proposition, which is, hey, we will increase the odds and protect you mm -hmm. as an investor by being involved with that capital you deploy to make sure that there's a higher probability and in, in a timely manner, those projects get to a point where you can get your returns. Got it. Well, Ben, thank you so much for yeah. coming on today. You know, um, all the way from Monte Carlo simulation in a, <laughs> in a minivan to a family office, that's quite a long way to come in seven years. And I look forward to seeing your growth in the next five years. I uh, appreciate so it, Raj. Thanks right. for having me. Have a good day. All right.